All right, good afternoon. This is a great day because Molly Hemingway is here, and I don't mean to gush or beam too much, but um, I see the size of this crowd and I know the uh, fans that she has as a writer for The Federalist, as a regular personality on Fox and other networks. Uh, but most of all, I think for this crowd, it is people know that Molly is knowledgeable and sincere as a person of faith, as a person of um, philosophical views that are rooted in freedom and who the human person is, and that comes through. And I like to think that comes through to people who don't even share them, who see her on television or read her work. I think that's true. I think that's why uh, she's so appealing to so many. I'm not going to read the bio that you can see in the program, uh, but Molly has been involved in journalism for her career while also being a wife and a mother and um, is what I think on the cutting edge of what is happening um, in journalism. That's why I asked her to do this, uh, to, to talk about what's happening with the media, uh, be as blunt and transparent about it as someone who's involved in it, and talk about maybe what some of the solutions are. And we can certainly do that in the Q&A. Before we bring her up, though, I did want to bring your attention to two things that are upcoming. You got this in your hand, I hope. It talks about our Education and Freedom Conference. This is going to be on October 19, all day in this building, uh, right here. And one of the rare occasions that we do a conference and try to focus more on policy than just our ideas. It's going to be a, a conference more about the ideas of liberty that make a difference in education reform. But we will be uh, bringing in experts who will talk specifically about, um, do I need to do something, Mark? Move this one, maybe? OK. That will um, look at every major problem in higher education and K-12 education from the perspective of liberty, personal liberty, family liberty, the role of the church, and others words very Kuyperian, very Leo the 13th, and figure out what the solutions are. So the people that are coming, and you have some of them listed there, are people that are regulars at Acton. Some have not been at Acton before, but we wanted them to have an opportunity to at least start our conversation about education reform. Uh, interestingly enough, we're doing an Education and Freedom Conference the day after we have our annual dinner. And Betsy DeVos will be our special guest, along with Father Robert, speaking at that on the 18th. So what the, the purpose of this flyer, I direct you to this red uh, chevron, or whatever that is right there. We would like, because of the uh, nature of this crowd, this regular loyal crowd to ALS, to offer you um, a comp admission. Your registration would be free to come to this Education and Freedom Conference if you register between now and Monday close of business. So there's a code there, ALS 2017. Please use that when you register online for the conference and um, do that through Monday if you would. But we want it to be something that combines a lot of the audiences that are regularly coming to ALS uh, and go perhaps a bit further. Um, if you can't stay for the whole day, it is divided between K-12 in the morning, higher ed in the afternoon, although they are being treated as uh, a seamless uh, understanding of the need for reforming education through personal liberty. And then our special speaker, our keynote speaker at lunch is Jeff Sandifer, a name that many of you know, uh, a friend of Acton, of course, he's been on our board, and uh, an innovator in his own right in education, both at uh, the secondary level as well as at the graduate level. So please uh, take note of that. If you didn't get one of these flyers, by all means, get one from us. And now please help me welcome Molly Hemingway. Thank you very much. Is that, does that, are we good? Do I get a thumbs up? Great. Yes? Okay, great, there we go. Well, it is wonderful to be here with you in Grand Rapids. This is only my second time here. I came a few years ago and just fell in love. And I had no idea that when we scheduled this that I would be out here during Art Prize, which is something that I have wanted to come to for years. And I had such a wonderful time walking around in your beautiful city and seeing this, this tremendous uh, public art and, and uh, getting to see the city a little bit more. But onto the topic at hand. Yesterday, Chuck Todd of NBC News was talking about Roy Moore the winner of the Republican primary for the Senate seat in Alabama. 
He said that Roy Moore, he said of him, where the phrase Christian conservative doesn't even begin to describe him. He said, if you don't understand just how freaked out some folks in the GOP and the White House are about what that means, then you don't know Roy Moore. First off, he doesn't appear to believe in the Constitution as written. So then it goes to a clip of Roy Moore saying, and I quote, our rights don't come from government. They don't come from the Bill of Rights. They come from Almighty God. <laughs> yes, this is like something you've heard in many inaugural speeches, all of our, you know, and Todd said, Chuck Todd said, now that's just a taste of what are very fundamentalist views that, you know, that have caused him trouble. I couldn't believe it when I was watching this. Uh, like, this is a guy who runs a very important show, Meet the Press. He's worked in journalism for decades. He's definitely a media elite. And he apparently doesn't know where Americans understand our rights come from. He has apparently never read the portion of the Declaration that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, and so on and so forth. You know, in Washington, D.C., we have the Jefferson Memorial, and they have these panels with quotes from Jefferson, and one of them says, the God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? And it's not even that Chuck Todd was doing something that odd. I have seen television hosts and others routinely get upset when constitutionalists refer to our rights coming from God and not men. And when Ted Cruz announced that he was running for president, he said something like that, and, and you saw media figures get really upset. Chris Cuomo got in a fight with someone over this issue, you know, loudly saying that our rights come from men. Okay, so there's that issue. On Monday, the Washington Post wrote a blockbuster story headlined, Obama sought to prod Facebook on Russia roll. The story was about how President Obama was so so distraught about Russia's meddling in the elections that he personally intervened with Mark Zuckerberg and asked him to take seriously Russia's role in meddling in the election. This was in 2016. So the next day, the paper quietly changed the headline in the online version, and they changed and added a little note that mentioned that, well, they had a conversation, but Obama never mentioned Russia. And I'm not entirely sure if that correction ran in the print version or not. And a third thing I think of is back in July on Independence Day, CNN tweeted out quotes from various founding fathers or important people in American history about freedom of the press and related topics. And one of them, and this was widely seen as a way to criticize the current president. So one of the quotes they tweeted from Abraham Lincoln read, let the people know the facts and the country will be free. It turned out that the quote was not accurate. And it was based, even there is a quote that's somewhat similar, but it's based on hearsay. So the, the real quote was, let them know the truth and the country is safe. And the context was about how Lincoln felt that people had been misled about the importance of preserving the union, but if they knew the importance of preserving the Union, that they would continue to fight as opposed to give up the fight. Um, so the fake quote refers to facts, and the real quote refers to truth. And I think it's a perfect conflation or error that speaks to modern journalism's problems. Facts are easy to manipulate, and truth is much more difficult to attain. Since we're talking about media credibility, I think that's intricately tied up in our understanding of freedom of the press. When I think of press freedom, I like to think back to the John Peter Zanger trial of 1735, when Andrew Hamilton famously got the jury to agree that truth can be brought in um, as a defense. But the trial itself was a disputation on truth and how truth is revealed to man. And it is our understanding of these things that relate to all of those things mentioned in the First Amendment. You know, first and foremost, religion, but also speech, press, and the like. And I think the press have been accorded a variety of perks and privileges 
in this country for hundreds of years based on the belief that seeking and speaking truth are necessary aspects of liberty, and on the assumption that the press were integral to the success of civil society, and that the press would exercise their power responsibly. I think for many Americans, there is a growing realization that the media have completely abdicated their responsibility and shown themselves hostile to the values and ideas that many Americans hold, and they're not good even with facts, much less truth. So much of the population no longer believes the media should be treated deferentially and given the power to shape, much less control, public opinion. It's actually not a great situation. It's very fraught, albeit with opportunities and dangers. But it's fraught because you need a strong media to have a functioning civil society, so you can hold government officials accountable, that you can have ways that people can talk with each other across divides, and that there can be trust when facing serious dangers, like an incoming missile or something that might be uh, threatening us from abroad. And that's not what we have now. Trust in the media has hit historic lows, and you could say that every year for the last several years. Gallup reported in September 2016 that Americans' trust and confidence in any way for the media to report the news fully, accurately, and fairly had dropped to its lowest level in polling history, with only 32% saying they had any trust in the media. That was down eight points over the previous year. And among Republicans, the situation was even worse, with only 14% of them having confidence. This was before the election. <laughs> and since the election, I'm not sure if they've handled things to really change this trajectory. It kind of depends on political party what your views of media trust are now. But when they were asked about print media, about newspapers last year, 28% of Democrats had a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in, in newspapers, and that rose to 46% this year, probably because they feel affinity for the hostility between newspapers and uh, po political people they oppose. It went the other way for Republicans. 16% of Republicans last year had trust in newspapers, and that's down to 13% this year. There was an Emerson College poll this spring, late spring, late winter, early spring, that showed that the Trump administration was considered truthful by 49% of voters, untruthful by 48%. The news media was considered untruthful by 53% of voters and only 39% who found them truthful. Among Republicans, 88% found the media untruthful. And, and even like more recent studies, there was something that just came out this month from Yale, Yale University where it found that 40% of the public are now willing to dismiss like perfectly true stories regardless of the source. They just, they've just lost the ability to trust anything that's coming out of them. Even if you say this is from NPR, like, I don't care, don't believe it. And if they, they were actually in this study trying to see if people cared about certain brands over other brands, so they made up some brand names. There was no difference between supposedly established, credible brand names and names that were made up. And I don't know if there's much changing on the horizon. The media seem to be continuing in their path in ways that anger people, you know, particularly on the right, but they're not really changing their approach in general. Complaining about the media is something that particularly Republicans have been doing for so long that you almost forget about it. Like, Everyone thinks Dwight Eisenhower is this very reasonable, moderate Republican. He got a standing ovation at a Republican convention by criticizing strongly the media, who he called sensation-seeking columnists and commentators who couldn't care less about the country or something like that. If you remember in George H.W. Bush's re-election campaign, like at every campaign stop, he would hold up what he said was his favorite bumper sticker, which said, annoy the media, re-elect Bush. <laughs> and, you know, everybody would hoot and holler, and he would complain about them. But really, you know, it, whether it was Richard Nixon or John McCain, Republican candidates have just complained a lot about the media. And you have conservative commentators on radio who dissect every story and look at the framing and look at the sourcing, and they've been doing that for a long time. And conservatives have complained so much about media bias that it really became trite. 
Journalists accepted the complaints just as part of doing business. They made little to no apparent attempt to improve the situation. In fact, I think you could argue that things have gotten worse or they got worse. But at some point, I think something broke. And I like to ask people what it was for you that made you go from the side of generally trusting the media to generally not. And what's fascinating is everybody has a different response for it. You know, a lot of people will mention something about Katrina coverage, you know, things that I might not have even picked up on. Uh, some people say that the fabulism of Jason Blair and Stephen Glass. Jason Blair was at the New York Times making up stories out of whole cloth. Stephen Glass was at the New Republic. He made up really amazing, dramatic stories that made conservatives look bad, you know, claiming that they were engaged in really inappropriate, lascivious behavior at their conferences or whatnot. Really fun read, completely invented, it turned out. Um, but knowing that people could just do that and get away with that for years, yeah, sure, those people were caught, but who else was out there doing something similar? The coverage of the Duke University lacrosse gang rape scandal had really affected a lot of people. Uh, the three men who were accused of a gang rape, it turned out they weren't just found not guilty, they were actually declared innocent by the judge, which is a very rare thing to just speak to how scandalous the prosecution uh, had been. But the media had, up until that point, kind of reported it as a referendum on everything from rape to racism, everything in between, trying to force what they like to say is a national conversation about these things. I always find it interesting, the national conversation seems much more like a lecture, where you know, you're just getting spoken to and you're not getting a lot of feedback or listening. Um, there was the media treatment of the Tea Party, a grassroots you know, movement where you had people with legitimate concerns about the expansion and the size and scope of government treated as just contemptuous and irrational, crazy people, racist also, um, protesters who showed up to nonviolently protest at town halls were disparaged as mentally unhinged, possibly violent. Uh, there was the, this happened in 2008, but it was revealed in 2010 that there was this secret email listserv called Journalist where both mainstream media types and opinion journalists would get together and talk about how to craft narratives or how to help out their preferred candidate at the time, uh, Barack Obama, then running for office. You know, they would say, we just need to paint the opposition as racist, and it doesn't even matter if this is based in fact. We just do it, and we, and we, we tear them down. Um, you know, another discussion talked about how to compare the Tea Party movement to Nazis. And when that was revealed in 2010, the relationship just continued to sour. One of my colleagues says that he thinks Twitter is the new journalist. So whereas people used to have these conversations sort of privately, you know, and they're private, it's not wrong for journalists to have private discussions about these things, but now it all happens publicly. You see on social media them working on crafting narratives in real time, and it can do a lot to decrease trust in members of the media. You know, you'll see people who actually write completely fair stories. They're fine but you know what they really think because they're sharing it with you, and it just makes it hard to trust that they're doing as good of a job as they could be doing. And then I personally think that the 2012 campaign was a huge break for Republicans. That was where you had you know, this squeaky clean, unfailingly nice, completely squishy moderate Mormon from Massachusetts and the media turned him into this sort of cartoonish, misogynist, and racist, and buffoon. And when voters saw that the media could do that even with someone like Mitt Romney, I think they just kind of gave up. They gave up trying to please or work with or in any way respect a media establishment. And then this was also happening in the context of coverage of the Obama administration. I was just watching this clip where all these journalists at the end of the um, at the end of the administration, everyone said, you know, the really remarkable thing about the Obama administration, completely scandal free. <laughs> you know, and you'd watch it and they really clearly believed it as if failure to cover scandals, you know, there's not an administration in history that is scandal free, but failure to cover scandals is not the same thing as being scandal free. And for a lot of Americans, you know, targeting political opponents with tax exempt status 
with declining tax exempt status is a scandal far worse than Watergate. So to not see the level of coverage applied to that that you would see applied to to other things was was really hurtful. You know, and there and you can go through various other scandals that were happening during that administration too. And then it's not just politics, although politics is what the media love to cover more than anything, but the way they cover religious liberty is not good. You know, right now there's a Supreme Court case going forward with a a cake baker in Colorado. He is Christian, he is an artist, he declines to bake cakes all the time. He's very devout in his belief. So if someone comes in and wants to do a cake for like a bachelor or bachelorette party, he won't do it. If they want to come in and do a Halloween cake, he won't do it because he doesn't believe in Halloween. He once had someone ask him to do a cake commemorating a divorce. He said he couldn't do that. And he was also asked to make a cake for a gay wedding, and he declined to do that. He's being sued. He's lost a lot of business. It's going before the Supreme Court. And the way the media treat this story is as if, well, this is just a guy who hates gay people and is persecuting them. He will serve cake to any gay person that walks in the store. He just declines to apply his artistic talent to certain to certain work because of his personal beliefs. These, are not these things are not covered well. Um, there was a 1990 study actually done by the Los Angeles Times, and it was put together, I forget the name of the reporter, I think it was David Carr, where he looked at how abortion was covered in the media. And he came up with all these things like that they, that he, he surveyed the landscape and said, they frame the abortion debate in terms favorable to those who support the practice. They quote abortion rights advocates more frequently and favorably than opponents. They ignore, or give minimal attention to events and issues favorable to abortion opponents. I think we saw this most famously with the coverage or lack thereof of Kermit Gosnell, who was on trial for the murders of some of the, of the women and children that he killed. Uh, this is a guy who kept trophies of his victims in his abortion clinic. His, he, he had racist uh, practices of, or he, he would make it so that he would only give you anesthesia if you paid for it and would not do proper anesthetizing for, for immigrants who were poor who were coming in for abortions. Um, there was, his clinic was soaked in cat urine. You couldn't actually vacate patients out if there was an emergency. He kept fetal parts in the refrigerator next to employee lunches. You know, this is like the type of story that normally you would expect, okay, we've got a serial killer on the loose who operated for decades. That's normally the kind of story you expect to see a lot of media coverage of. And there was a sensational trial. You had a bunch of people telling amazing stories. There were angles for crime reporters, non-crime reporters, health policy reporters, everybody. And yet the media had to be absolutely shamed into giving this anything more than cursory attention. There was a Washington Post reporter who had written like dozens and dozens of stories on uh, you know, things favorable to abortion rights supporters. And she was asked by me why she hadn't covered Gosnell. And she said she doesn't cover local crime. Which, you know, is itself obviously not true. We cover local crime all the time because it's a great way to explore deeper issues, you know, whether it's the Newtown, Connecticut shooting of those poor school children, uh, the Trayvon Martin killing, the shooting by the police of Michael Brown in Ferguson, you know, riots in Baltimore and elsewhere. We cover local stories all the time. But whether the topic has been religion, family, human life, guns, conservative governance, or even sports, the media bias has become so pronounced and the trouble with accuracy is such an epidemic. I think once particularly conservatives, but also other marginalized groups, saw the problems, they couldn't unsee them. It's even on subtle issues that I think people have begun to pick up on. The way certain marches are celebrated and covered at length while other marches are downplayed, like the annual pro-life marches. Um, reacting hysterically to natural disasters that occurred during Republican presidencies while giving the benefit of the doubt to oil spills or natural disasters that occurred during Democratic presidency, Democratic tenures. You know, spinning comments made by conservatives as sexist and bigoted, but really framing everything in the gentlest possible way when, when charged comments come from liberals or just providing context or explication. And hiding balancing viewpoints at the end of the story so they can say, see, we did include this, you know, yes, in paragraph 32 on page, you know, D24, it did, you did finally get to the balancing comment, and so on and so forth. So 
Following Donald Trump's win, I think a lot of people in the media did realize that they had not done a good job covering the 2016 election, though how they have responded to that is most curious. But the Washington Post did something that I think they should have done during the campaign, which is they asked Trump voters why they voted for Trump. It seems simple, but was somehow not, this was mostly missed until after the election. But I found so many of the responses fascinating because so many specifically mentioned the media. Nicole Citro said, as Trump cleared each hurdle during the campaign and I saw how the media, the establishment, and celebrities tried to derail him, my hope began to grow that I would be able to witness their collective heads explode when he was successful. <laughs> so, Diane, Diane Mouse said, the media did the United States a huge disservice in covering the campaign. Lori Myers, I voted for Donald Trump because the media was so incredibly biased. They were unhinged in their obvious role as the Clinton campaign propaganda, propaganda machine. The collusion was too much. And Samantha Styler said, I am a gay millennial woman, and I voted for Donald Trump because I oppose the political correctness movement, which has become a fascist ideolo ideology of silence and ignorance. After months of going back and forth, I decided to listen to him directly and not through the minced and filtered quotes from the mainstream media. So I think the media itself became part of the, of the issue here in how this election turned out. Michael Crichton wrote this really great essay about, uh, against speculation. That's what most of the essay is about. But he has this part in there where he talks about something called the Gelman amnesia. And that's where you open the newspaper, you see an article about something that you actually know quite well. And you read the article, and you see that the journalist has absolutely no idea what he is talking about doesn't know the facts, he doesn't understand the context, he gets it wrong so he actually presents the story backward, reversing, reversing cause and effect. And you read it and you're exasperated or you're, you're amused at how many errors you see in it. And then you turn the page and you read a story on international affairs and you read it as if the rest of the newspaper were somehow completely reliable. <laughs> you know, that the story on Palestine is completely accurate and the, unlike the baloney that you just read. You turn the page and you forget what you know, he said. He went on, Crichton went on to say that in other aspects of our life, if you enc encounter serial liars or people who exaggerate, you discount them. But when it comes to the media, he said, we believe against evidence that it is prob probably worth our time to read other parts of the paper, when in fact it almost certainly is isn't. What I wonder is if, what if the errors are now so routine, the narrative pushing is so blatant, the defensive defiance of elites in the media so extreme, and the partisan bias so pronounced that people are no longer slipping back into that amnesia. What if they're just done? They're sick and tired of the entire media industry and distrustful of many of the stories that they encounter. And then I wonder, what does that mean going forward? I would love if the media would stop getting defensive about our mistakes, uh, or defensive about criticism in general, really trying to understand it. It would be great to see people get out of their bubbles. Yesterday, there was this reporter who learned that some group of the population would get $1,000 in tax relief under the new tax reform plan. And she's like, $1,000? That doesn't matter. That's nothing. And I thought, I think we know where this person lives. You know, <laughs> Probably New York City, right? Um, and I wish they would stop tweeting so much because of, like I mentioned, I don't think journalists are quite as bad as their social media would indicate. And I wish we would get people to admit mistakes fully. It would have been great to see this, even in clearly, I think objectively speaking, coverage of the last election was just not well done. It would have been great to see some real full-throated mea culpas and understanding of what had been done poorly there. Um, if we would have seen efforts to create real diversity in the newsroom. And again, this is, this is an issue that I think conservatives think a lot about, but there are other groups that are, that are not well represented in newsrooms, and you can see the lack of that voice in a lot of stories. And uh, that needs to be changes, not just in entry level, but in people who are assigning stories, editors, and, and people who are uh, higher up. It would be nice to see just more accountability and transparency in general. If we want to hold the powerful accountable, if we want to build community, if we want to be taken seriously, I would love to see the media work to repair our damaged credibility. And I think it could happen, so I wish that it would start 
soon. Okay, that is actually all I have uh, for prepared remarks, but I'm happy to take questions. Absolutely. Join me in thanking Molly. And uh, Chris and Drew uh, have the microphone, so if you would raise your hand and, and they'll acknowledge you. And uh, I would ask you to keep your questions short and your comments very, very short so that everyone gets a chance to ask their questions. So you two take it away. Everybody in this audience, I've been to many action events, are really quite knowledgeable. And we certainly appreciate your comments. I would like your opinion on, and I'll set it this way, um, Civil rights movement, most people think, started in 1960-something. And it probably started considerably longer or earlier than that. Nonetheless, national observations of desegregation was prominent in the 60s. My question is, if you could comment upon, why would not a similar method be used effectively to desegregate the media? It's a great question, and it's interesting because the media have been talking about some of the problems they have with representation for a while. The main problem being they're not interested in telling st the story of their own failure, obviously. So if you need... But the media were interested in telling the story, and there is a lot of power that the media have. So I think with if people... There are means by which, and this is one of the things that's very cool about our current moment, is that whereas it used to be that a few families and a few newspapers controlled the entire discourse, one of the good things about social media is that you're getting alternate viewpoints you and you're able up. to get them into the public sphere, and it would be, you know, it would require some coordinated effort. Um, I don't know, it's a good question, but it would require some actual thought about how to have specific goals for change. It's one of the things I've been thinking about with the current NFL protest and what could be improved is having a specific goal of what you're trying to accomplish and then working to implement that goal. Um, so perhaps some entrepreneurial funder type should look into that. But it's just a free market for media. Good. Well, and, but I would say social media has created more of that market, and that is... I mean, there are opportunities. It used to be that you could only rise to the top if you followed a very particular trajectory. Now you can break through from you know, anywhere in the country. Yeah, I'm fascinated by sports media's decision to replace sports with politics because it's it seems like it is not working well for them. I don't think that's the entire reason why people are tuning out ESPN or turning off the NFL. But I think this is, again, one of the downsides of the current media environment is that you're expected to fill so much time each day. You know, it used to be that you might have, like, Sports Center on at night, but not a lot of other talk on ESPN. You had one half hour, one beautiful half hour of, you know, just covering what was happening in sports for the day. Now people have to fill. And when you have to fill, you end up talking about things that maybe are better left unsaid. And I wonder if we're going to see some boutique media outlets that cater more to respecting the game, just focusing on the game. Um, but. I think, you know, there's a lot of incentive that people have. A lot of media is produced in D.C. and New York, and I think we probably understand that those places are a bit out of touch with the rest of the country. And the incentives within those peer groups are to keep doing what they're doing. So I think at the end of the day, it'll all come down to whether they lose enough money to make a change. Molly, right here. You know, the... Uh, <coughs> You're not the first one that's talked about media and the problem with media. I think you need to tell us then what is good media and what is bad media. And I happen to, for one, I happen to think C-SPAN is good media. It's unrehearsed. 
We don't have somebody up there that's got their mind made up ahead of time, and people can call in whatever they believe and explain, you know, tell, and then the person is expected. So would you please tell us what is good media and what is what you consider is bad media? Yeah, I, I love that you brought up C-SPAN. I've been thinking about how it used to be even maybe 10 or more years ago that you would have initial news coverage would just be a description of an event. There was a hearing, and this is what was said at the, at the hearing, or there was a rally, and here's what was said at the rally. The media served this function of conveying to you what had happened at an event that you were not able to go to yourself. And because so many things are broadcast live now, I think a lot of media first stories begin with analysis. They begin with the context. They think, oh, well, if someone wanted to know about that hearing, they would have just watched. So they immediately move on to spin. And that's why I agree with you. C-SPAN is a revelation. You can actually just see it yourself, make up your own mind about what you think about what you saw. Uh, you know, they cover hearings, they cover events, even, you know, lectures or whatnot. And then later you might have analysis, you know, elsewhere. But uh, I think, you know, I don't know. I, I worry because this isn't just a supply problem, but a demand problem. And I worry that people are losing critical thinking skills. This relates to how we're educating people and what we are encouraging in their education. They just want to be told that what they feel is right. And so I don't think as many people are watching and trying to learn and making up their own minds as they want people to affirm them in their preconceived notions. Oh, back up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, along the same lines, I wonder how you feel about the concept of infotainment. I think of NPR where they'll have uh, a new story and then it's almost like melodrama. They'll have a little musical snippet afterwards that uh, sets an emotional tone for what's just been said. Um, if it's a Republican, it will be a dark musical piece. <laughs> And uh, if it's a liberal, it will be some happy, jaunty tune. Uh, isn't that corrupting news to try to inject an emotional tag on it to make it infotainment? And I think of news anchors or interviewers that are interviewing somebody, and they cut them short if they don't like if they think they're getting too boring. They cut them short, and you you don't get them to, you don't get to hear them finish their sentence. It seems like a heck of a lot of it is uh, aimed at entertainment and not news. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it actually relates to the same problem I just addressed, which is that this is partly a demand problem. And I think of it, I, I prefer to write. That's my background. I like to thoughtfully think through what I'm going to say and then say it and change my words and say, oh, that wasn't quite right. And, and then I also do TV, where you're not afforded that chance at all. You just have to say something right away. And you have to say it in such a way, like you're, you're really not supposed to say on television, I don't know. <laughs> Which is what I always want to say. Or like, huh, I'd like to think about that one for a little bit. It's like people didn't tune in to see you reflect. They, turn, they tune in to see you immediately respond with barely a moment's hesitation to something that's happening. And they will turn the channel if you don't do that. So is it the fault of these media corporations for recognizing human behavior, or is the fault within us? I think one of the key, key things, obviously, I, I mean, I do both print and TV, and I encourage everybody to consume their media both ways, but it, it is probably helpful for us to do more reading than watching or listening, because um, when you're getting to the level of how you know, like the jaunty music or whatnot, you're dealing with such deep levels of unconscious bias that it's a very difficult thing to overcome. I do want to say that I did NPR a bunch last year. They had a little, they had some of their straight news people become a little bit more partisan, so they were trying to find other people to kind of balance it out. And it was always so delightful to, you just say something like very gentle, like, rights come from God, you know, 
not man. And boy, the phone lines are lighting up and you're getting really nasty email, like just the slightest little thing and people haven't encountered it necessarily on NPR, but. Sorry. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my question is about uh, how soon do you think until we have real censorship in a pretty much across the board situation. Um, for example, uh, Jennifer Roback Morris, who spoke at the uh, Acton uh, University, uh, her Ruth Institute was shut down by her credit card company because uh, they said she has a racist organization or something uh, because she supports um, family. Um, and that's just the beginning. I mean, there's many things. I'm active in the pro-life movement, and Facebook, Twitter, YouTube have all cut out uh, selected videos they think are against uh, abortion right. And uh, they're very happy to promote uh, abortion rights in every situation. Right. It's a really good question, and everybody should be thinking much more about this issue. Um, is that me doing this? Sorry. I hear the, this ringing. Um, OK, great, we're good. But corporations that control these platforms are clearly interested in shutting down speech they don't like. And is this a free speech issue? Well, they're private corporations. They have the right to ban whoever they want to ban from Twitter or from payment systems or whatnot. At the same time, it's, it's extremely chilling. And it always seems to go in one direction, which is that the person who argues that marriage only makes sense as a union of man and woman gets censored, but no level of extremism on the other side can even get any pushback. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know what the answer is, and I worry that many people will seek to force a government um, fix that that is not good, but that it'll be in response to something that's clearly not good. You know, Václav Havel talked a lot about how totalitarianism can happen apart from the state. And I think that's something that people in America have not thought through as much as they should. Uh, you know, Brendan Eich was fired from Mozilla for believing that marriage is a union of a man and a woman. And that's scary. You know, someone who's clearly good at his job, who is responsible for the company. Um, if it happens to him, it's going to happen to all of us. And I think we have to be prepared for that persecution to come. But in the meantime, people need to get out of their comfort zones and actually speak publicly against some of what's happening. And you know, I, th I see this dynamic all the time because of the power differential. It's very safe to say even the most radical leftist things. It's not safe to say a gentle conservative thing on Facebook. Well, people need to just start standing up a little bit more and pushing back, I think. And everyone, all the scholars really need to think about this much more because it's going to be very tricky how to navigate it. To me, um, a lot of this is about follow the money. <clears throat> um, and I think Trump was on to something with the NFL because that's going to cost the owners of the football teams probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And that will get their attention. What will get the attention of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and whatever else uh, when it comes to follow the money? And do you see something finally happening when people make their choices as to where they spend their money? as to what that will do with the media? Has it started? Is it going to start? Or are you disappointed that it hasn't to the extent it should? This is, these are difficult questions. <laughs> um, like one of the things that I find interesting is, gosh, I, I can't remember which Russia scare story the Washington Post put out. There have been so many. Um, they had a story where they said that it blew their servers. Every, they'd had the highest traffic that they'd ever had, and it was so exciting. And when it happened, the newsroom applauded in cheers. And I, you know, as someone who measures traffic by how many people are hitting my site, I get it. But I'm also not a, a, a mainstream news organization. Why did they not get excited about the potential to get readers about Obama scandals? You know, if it were just money, 
they would have done, they would have dug, because there was certainly a market for people with good investigative resources to look into what was happening in that administration. So it's not just about money, but then even on the money side, they're doing just fine. They did fine during the Obama administration. There is a huge market of people, you know, and this is not just liberals. Liberals and conservatives both do this. They just want to be told what they want to hear. And so if you're going to publish, you know, pretty one-sided stuff, there will always be a pretty big market for that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. That's, wait, that's what I was not supposed to say. Sorry. Um, but I really don't know. Um, but people do, I think, they do need to start thinking through their actions, including their pocketbooks and who they are giving resources to and whether they want to do that. I am not a boycotter at all. It's just not in my nature. But I have recently started feeling like if a corporation is just overtly hostile to me, I just don't shop there anymore, which I guess is a boycott. Um, <laughs> but I think that you'll start to see a little bit more of that. And people, I mean, people should think about whether material issues are more important to them than the values that they hold. This is just a brief comment about the Jennifer Roback Morse um, Ruth Institute experience. Um, she actually defended the credit card company's decision to pull out, saying she just wants the same freedom for the cake bakers. And there seems, I mean, I'm biased probably, but there seems to be a consistency among conservatives, even when we don't like it, in a way that you don't see that sort of consistency. On you the do other side. see that consistency, but I also think you're seeing people getting fed up with that consistency. Like, what does it? I think you're seeing people say, like, what does that? What good does that do for us? We don't fight back, but we let them punch us. Well, there are certain people who are always going to be that way, probably related to religious views. They understand that that's what their life will include. But I worry also that that's not attractive to an increasingly secular portion of the country, and that then we get to the issue of bad solutions to big problems, but can I, I'm, I can't really see, but there, I mean, over here, sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all the good work that you and your colleagues do at The Federalist, uh, which helps to restore my faith in the media. Thank you. Um, secondly, when you posed the question, what was the breaking point for me on media? bias. One, I guess, was when the Los Angeles Times announced that the science was settled, so therefore they would never, ever cover any story that cast doubt on the theory of man-made climate change. And then on the other coast, the New York Times last year on the front page during the campaign announced that Donald Trump was so far beyond the pale that they would no longer apply objective news reporting which uh, just it just astonished me that they would say that. I, I, I always knew that, but yes. I just couldn't believe that they would say it. And so I guess my question to you, have you reached your breaking point? And if so, what was it? I, I was actually feeling a bit bad about talking how we talk about the promise and the peril because I'm, I'm kind of depressed right now about the current state. I really thought that after the election would have been a good time to reflect and, and you know, instead of promoting the people who had been the worst in the election or hiring them at better papers, trying to hire someone who actually had talked to a Trump voter or you know, just doing anything or just even admitting, gosh, we, we messed this up and doing it in a real way. Um, that Jim Rutenberg front page was August of 2016. It was put on the front page. And I, I, I think he, what he was trying to say is this is what reporters themselves are saying. Um, but he was saying Donald Trump is such a threat that we have to throw out all of our journalistic standards. And the editor of the New York Times, a couple months later, said at a, at a journalism conference that he thought Jim Rutenberg had gotten it right. So this was not just a column on the front page that might represent a different viewpoint. This was kind of the editorial stance of the, of the entire newspaper, which is a little bit unfair, because actually the New York Times was not that bad during the election. They were one of the few papers to actually sense that there were stories there related to Hillary Clinton's problems. And they, you know, they, they weren't as bad as I think sometimes they, they get treated as. Uh, but yeah, how do you trust someone when you think, well, you're willing to throw out the rule book just to attack someone that you consider a threat? You have already assumed that. You know, if, if, if there's a story where I'm not able to be unbiased, I just don't cover it because that's not my job, unless my job is to be biased in that case, you know, if I'm trying to argue for something. And if you think you can't cover someone because of that, you, that's fine. Just step away. And in fact, that would be the best thing that could happen. Just have everybody step away. 
go cover Broadway or something for a little bit and just take a breather, come back when you feel a little bit better. But. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Molly, in this era of billionaires buying up media outlets that are ideologically driven, not so much worried that they're going to lose money because they're making lots of money in some other endeavor, is there any place in America that you would recommend for some somewhat objective fact-checking anymore? Because today you almost have to ha find a fact-checker to check the fact-checkers. I was saying to someone the other day that it's the easiest job in media today because you just don't check. Fact-checking is an amazingly flawed enterprise. It is so interesting to me how it arose. I mean, the whole object of journalism in the American model w should be that you're fact-checking in the course of doing your work. You know, you're just only saying things that are verifiable or you're attributing them to people if they're not. And fact-checking kind of arose out of this idea that George Bush had been playing fast and loose with the facts. And if only we could have held him to account, we could have prevented him from winning re-election or something like that. Um, I read so many fact checks that are laughably bad that I can't even recall the one from last week that I couldn't believe how bad it was. Um, gosh, what was, oh, oh, I know. It was um, Donald Trump says that ratings are down. So this is false, because really, they're only down you know, a little bit. And he said they were down a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then they used all these facts showing stuff like, it was down 9% over the previous year, which is a lot, you know? <laughs> like, or, you know, that's such a subjective thing anyway. Um, so I just think the entire enterprise of fact-checking is flawed, and it's frequently staffed by people who are too young or too unable to keep their biases at bay to make it work. And so I'm a little discouraged about that, too, because it would be great to have some resources. Um, I am actually part of, or I'm about to be part of something called the News Literacy Project, which is a bipartisan group that is trying to help schools and classrooms help kids learn to navigate stories and discern fake news from, from real news. And I, I mean, I think this is good. That there's a model that can be done within the classroom to kind of help people evaluate facts. One of the things that was very helpful for me growing up in Denver is we had the Rocky Mountain News and we had the Denver Post. Just reading two articles about the same thing, I could say, oh, they kind of approached that a little differently. And it would help me just think more critically. And so we need to have ways of helping not just kids but also adults learn how to evaluate facts and be able to push aside things that confirm their biases. Hi, Molly. Hello. Uh, so a lot of what I've been hearing you talk about, it seems like it could really be leveled as a critique against national political journalism. Uh, but I was, I've been wondering about local journalism, if you have any thoughts about whether this crisis of credibility um, is, is uh, alive and well in community news and community journalism, or if that's sort of a different animal. Yes, great question. So. Usually when people poll on your level of trust in the media, they, they poll on national media, large media, mainstream media. And so we don't quite have the same level of understanding of what's happening at local media. But when it is polled, people have much more confidence in their local media. And they particularly do about local reporters doing local journalism. So a lot of the problem with local media now is that you're getting fed stuff from national wires that are not, you know, just you're getting a lot of new, I mean, that's always been the case, but you're getting more of that and less investment in local journalism, which can be, uh, can be a problem. Um, so it would be great. Like one of the things I loved about The Federalist is part of our business model is that we have writers throughout the country intentionally. We do not want people, I mean, I live in D.C. We do not want people in D.C. very much um, or New York. We have them. We have more than enough. We want to hear what people throughout the rest of the country are saying, what their ideas are for solving problems, you know, what their experiences are. It saved us last year because everybody in New York and D.C. was like, what's going on? And everybody else in the rest of the country was like, yeah, this is weird, but here's what my neighbor said, you know. And you got just a totally different perspective. I think one of the things that you could be done, it's expensive, but it would be so great, is to have, like, people actually embedded in local communities reporting back to the national media and for their local media, you know, having it 
instead of having it all be top down to local, having a little bit of feedback. And this used to be something we did. We stopped doing it because of how expensive it is. But it would be a great way to restore credibility between news organizations and, and the people. And when you're actually living there, you know, there, there's a type, sorry, I get all ex excited about this, but there's a type of person who wants to live in New York and DC that's almost as important as that they live in New York and DC. It's a different type of person than the one who's like, I do not want to go there. Those people are not my people. I want to live elsewhere. You're just going to get a different mindset and more diversity of thought. And you're going to get people who have to live among people that are different from those New York and DC milieus. And that is so key and wonderful. And it's a great way to create civil discourse throughout the country. So thank you for asking. Yes. Oh. Grand Rapids is home to probably 25 academic institutions of higher learning. And major goal is to develop better global citizens, future leaders, improve their character development. So my question is, after listening to the brokenness of the system, what's your perspective through the eyes of this millennial and next generation? And do you have any ideas for us on what we should be doing better? Once again, I mean, it's a great question. I really feel bad about you asking me in my current state where I'm all you know, not as positive as I could be. But um, I wonder if what we're not going to see, it seems like there's just a general breakdown in, in civility in the country and that it's affecting many different communities. Almost like you're feeling like you're about to have some really bad breaking point. I don't want to sound dramatic, but it's kind of like preceding global conflict or a national conflict. But sometimes in those bad things, you can have people who see a way forward, a way to create new pathways for people being tolerant with each other or re, um, reassociating themselves with principles of the founding. I mean, we really are a different country than, than any other country in terms of what brought us together as a people. And I do think we have kind of lost that and lost how that enables us to live together across our differences. And I wonder if it's not for the millennial generation, which is totally derided unfairly. I have many millennials who work for me. They're actually really hardworking. They are really, it's just, it's like very different than what you hear in the media again about how they're lazy or they don't know how to keep jobs or get jobs or whatnot. They're hardworking, they're entrepreneurial, they have great ideas. And I hope that maybe some of these people will help us uh, in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you, Molly.